You know, another thing is don't question. Our questions are not perfect. So many people without a uh, question without listening. You cannot get a perfect answer from an imperfect question. It is not my place to question God, but to be receptive to his word will answer even the questions I cannot and have not asked yet. You know, curiosity and wonder are gifts from God, I believe. But this atheist, defiant, spiteful uh, slew of questions merit no answer. I believe God is always talking to us, but so few of us listen. I think it's time to listen, not to talk or question. To expect answers without questions seems really obscure. I know that, but that applies when talking with man. To converse with the Almighty is to listen. So yeah, I was I was raised as a Christian. I did everything that a Christian child should do. I prayed. I prayed every evening, I guess, when I went to bed. Um, my parents would always kiss me on the cheek with a God bless, and uh, I prayed, or at least I tried to pray. But even at a very young age, and I remember it very clearly, I didn't feel anything. I would talk to God in my room, and I would feel nothing, just nothing. No warm feeling, no feeling like I was getting through, just nothing. And I asked other people, well, how do you pray? Am I, am I doing it wrong? And people would say, no, you just you just talk to God. That's, that's how you do it. That's how you get your connection. But it didn't work for me. And as I got slightly older, so I'm probably talking about kind of eight, nine, ten, I, I thought there was something wrong with me. I thought that everybody else on the planet had been born with some kind of seed of God in them that I'd just been born without. And I asked people how they felt and if they could feel it, and people said yes. People would, as I know now, <laughs> lie to me occasionally, because I'm pretty sure all the people that I, that I asked didn't feel anything, but were telling me that I should be feeling something. And it was very, it's a very horrible feeling as a kid to think that you are broken, that you are defunct and you don't work properly. And that's how I felt for a very long time. In the laboratory, we have reproduced every aspect of the God experience, every essence, every component of it, from the rising sensation to the feelings of ecstasy to the feelings of a sensed presence to the feelings that you're at one with the universe. We can do that experimentally. What we have found is that individuals who show a temporal lobe sensitivity and who are very religious, in that setting, they will have a religious experience. We can generate the sensed presence which is defined as God. It is not my place to question God. We're getting tantalizingly close to a comprehensive cognitive neuroscience of religious belief. Robust theories, empirical evidence. But this atheist, defiant, spiteful uh, slew of questions merit no answer. And it deepens the conflict between uh, science and religion. Not just the science of evolutionary biology, which Darwin started, but the science of the mind, the evolutionary cognitive neuroscience, which Darwin also started. And it deepens that conflict. And it is not long before any psychology textbook, for a psychology textbook to be current and up to date, it will have to include this cognitive neuroscience of religion. And it's not going to be long before a John Scopes or a Jane Scopes moves to teach cognitive neuroscience of religion in a high school class in a public school and you and I know that there will then be litigation the litigation uh, will be brought by the religious right and I think I hope given what I've shown you this morning that your feeling about that litigation is the same as mine which is bring it on thank you very much it is not my place to question God.